In the previous videos, we've introduced the SPI master in VHDL. This video is going to be adding a chip select on top of that code. So we're going to instantiate that SPI master. We're going to write a wrapper around it that gives chip select functionality and the support for sending multiple bytes a little bit easier. It's something you do very commonly. So let's dig into that. Um, the place to find this code is if you go to github.com forward slash NAND land, N-A-N-D-L-A-N-D. Click on the SPI dash master repository and you will see VHDL and Verilog. We're doing VHDL. And we're gonna be talking about this SPI master with single chip select in this video. So we'll talk about this file, which is right here. So let's dig in. This should look pretty similar to the SPI master, except we've added a few more ways to control it. Uh, so parameters, um, parameters now we have SPI mode, that should look familiar. Um, if you wanna check out which one's which, go to Wikipedia and look for the SPI page and you'll figure out uh, which SPI mode is corresponds to what. Clocks per half bit, we've used that before. Uh, these two are new though. Max bytes per CS, maximum bytes per chip select. So this is the maximum number of bytes you're gonna send when chip select goes low. Maybe you're gonna send only one byte at a time. That's fine, you can set that to one. If you're gonna send, maybe maybe in one transaction you're gonna send 100, set that to 100. Um, the reason for that is that it'll just specify the widths of some of the counters inside this module. So you need to specify that in advance uh, because the tools need to know how big to size things. CS and active clocks, this is some extra functionality that might be useful for some chips require some, some dead time, some time when the chip select is high between transactions. So you send a byte, you send another byte right after it, but you want chip select to be high for 100 nanoseconds, 200 nanoseconds, whatever it is. Check the individual data sheet of whatever you're trying to talk to to figure out how long to make this. Um, but you can specify this in number of clocks, so number of input clocks. So if your input clock's 100 megahertz, uh, and you need, so that's a 10 nanosecond clock, and you need 50 nanoseconds of dead time, you can set this to five, and that'll, that'll work. Um, you can always, there's no reason to make this larger unless you really care about like throughput. You can just make this like extra big if you want, um, or you, maybe you don't even need it. Some ships don't require it, so. Check your data sheets, folks. All right, let's dig in. So. The SPI master with single chip select module, here are those uh, generics that we talked about. If I said parameters before, that's because that's a Verilog word. We're in VHDL, so these are generics. Uh, we have the input reset, input clock, and we have the MOSI interface here. So TX, so TX count is new. Um, TX byte and data valid and ready look, should look the same. Uh, but the purpose of TX count is to specify the number of bytes that you're going to send. So if it's the if it's the beginning of a transaction, you want to specify the count uh, for that particular transaction. So this this is going to be, uh, you know, five, set it to five, it's going to send five bytes out, for example. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, and similarly, on the Rx side, ORx count is an index into whatever byte you're receiving. So it's just a convenient way to know which byte you are on in the middle of a transaction, of a, of a multi-byte transaction. Again, if this is just, if you're just sending one byte out and you're receiving one byte, you can just set the counts to one and ignore it. Um, but uh, it's handy if you have, if you have variable length transactions, maybe you're talking, to, you know, sometimes it's one byte long, sometimes it's five bytes long, you can set the counts appropriately uh, and the chip select will just work. It'll kind of abstract away some of the chip select stuff for you, which is handy. Um, <clears throat> so here's your SPI interface. Now we have this extra output, which is the O chip select N active low. Cool. I use a state machine to control where we are in in the middle of a transaction. So if we're in idle, if we're in transfer, we're actually transferring. And then the CS inactive is that at the end of the transaction, you have that time where the chip select is high and you want to count, that's what that's for. Uh, I usually like to define sta uh, a user defined data type and use that as my signal uh, for controlling my state machine. It's just a little more obvious when you run the simulation where you are and it's nice to use human readable words instead of just hidden bits that you don't understand what's happening. So I like that. Um, here's the SPI master itself. This is the one we talked about previously, so this should look very familiar. And here is the state machine. So it's not too, too bad. Um, it's one process to control the state machine. I don't like dual process state machines. That's for a separate topic. Um, 
but let's see, so reset comes along and kind of resets things back to a good state. And then you're basically gonna be in idle, just sitting there until something happens. And what's going to happen is you're going to get, you can leave idle when, when chip select is high and when TX data valid is, is a pulse, is being pulsed. So you pulse TX data valid, that's gonna say like, okay, let's kick off this transmission. You're going to register again, you know, internally register any external signals. So RTX count gets registered internally and we're gonna be driving chip select low immediately indicating that the transaction has started. And then we're gonna to go to the transfer state in which we're gonna be sending the bytes. <clears throat> so we're in transfer and we basically sit in transfer until W master ready, which is an output of the SPI master goes high. So this will go low immediately when we start sending a, a data byte through it because uh, the master is gonna be doing its thing, serializing the input byte. And then X number of clock cycles later, this will pulse high and say that it's ready. And then we know, okay, next byte, time for the next byte to get shipped out if there is a multi-byte transaction. And the way we know that is by looking at the RTX count signal. So if RTX counts greater than zero, then we know we got more data to send. We're going to wait for the data valid pulse to be pulsed by the higher level module. And when that happens, we decrement the counter and continue on with our transaction. If the RTX count is equal to zero, then we are done. And we can jump down here, say we're done. So chip select goes high and then go to the CS inactive clock state. And again, the purpose of that is to just, just count for some number of clock cycles to delay the next transaction from occurring. So if the inactive counts is greater than zero, we decrement. So I usually like to count down to zero. Um, you can count up if you want. It doesn't really matter too much, but I, I usually just do that. And when, it's, when the CS inactive counts is equal to zero, we go back to idle state. On the RX side, there is a little process here just to control your RX counter. So if you're in the middle of a multi-byte transaction, you need to know, you need to keep track of your receiver count. And if it's, we, we're gonna initialize it to zero. That's what this is doing. Uh, yeah, VHDL is strongly typed. So a lot of the times you have to do these type conversions all the time. Like this is just a flexible way to initialize RX count. The reason it's such a long line, maybe this is worth talking about, is that ORX count is of type standard logic vector. It's actually not specified. The width is not specified here, which is kind of a neat trick. Um, and it'll be specified uh, during the, when the higher level module instantiates this module, it'll have to specify, the higher level module will specify the width and this will just inherit that width from the higher level module. Um, but you, but in order to be flexible in, in this code, you actually need to do, so, all right, so we're gonna set this to zero and we're gonna use ORX count tick length, which is a VHDL tick attribute. There are a few of them. They are kind of handy ways to do stuff. So this will get the length in number of bits of this standard logic vector to use as an input to the two unsigned function. So this is converting a number to an unsigned vector. And you need to know the number itself and then the length of that vector. So that's what those two parameters are. So then you get an unsigned, an unsigned bit vector uh, of some length, but that's not of type O, the ORX count is of type standard logic vector. So you need to convert that unsigned to a standard logic vector and then you have your, your data. So that's a really complicated way to make us to write zero. You know, in Verilog, you can just do like that. And that, that, that just works. Verilog's like, cool, I know what to do. HDL, mm, you're a little more strongly typed with things like this. So you get some code that looks a little confusing, but uh, you get used to tricks like this. Okay, uh, oh, else if ORX data valid equals one. When this is the SPI master, I believe, right? Yeah, uh, this is the SPI master saying, um, that there's there's something been received on the master in MISO line. And when that happens, we increment the RX counter by one. So take the value of RX count, which is a standard logic vector, cast it to an unsigned, increment it by one, because you can only increment by, you can only increment or decrement, do math operations if you if it's defined as unsigned or signed. So we it's an unsigned counter, 
um, increment it, then we cast it back to a standard logic vector and assign it to Rx count. Cool. Uh, the chip select itself, this is just an internal signal, so we're routing it to an external signal. And then this is some pretty complicated logic here. I'll make this a little bigger so you can see it. So OTX ready. So when when is the when is this module ready for more data? There's a few cases to handle. Um, it's mostly equal to one when data valid is not equal to one, and when you're in idle. So if you're in idle, um, you're you're ready. If you're ready for more data, and you just want to make sure that when the data valid pulse comes along, you drive this guy low. Or you're ready when you're in the transfer state and the master is ready, so the low-level spy master is ready, and your TX counter is greater than zero. Those are the three things that need to be true, and otherwise you're, you're not ready for more data. So that's probably the most complicated line, and um, you can just simulate it, make sure that your logic's good for things like that, which I have done. Um, so that's the explanation of the spy master with single chip select. The next video is going to be the test bench simulating this code, making sure that things are working, and we're going to use EDA Playground again, similar to how we used it for the SPI master to test out this code. So stay tuned for that. Hey, I just wanted to jump in at the end of this video real quick to say, please check out patreon.com forward slash NANDland and consider supporting me there. I would really appreciate it. It helps me cranking out these good tutorials and these videos. So if you found this valuable, uh, consider heading over to Patreon and supporting me. Keep me making good content. Uh, in addition to that, please consider getting yourself a Go board so you can actually program this code and try it out on real hardware. They're available at nanland.com. And thanks for your support.